as the choir comes down. And if you would stand this morning, let's continue to sing about the Lamb of God, the one that took my place and your place, that loves us so very much. Oh, sovereign God, join us as we sing this morning. Oh, sovereign God, oh, matchless King, the saints adore, the angels sing, and fall before your throne of grace. To you belong the highest praise. These sufferings, this passing time, under your wings.
grace that will pardon and cleanse with me. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is grace. and endless grace that you have given to each of us. Lord, we ask you this morning that you would continue to bless. Lord, as your word is opened up to us, Lord, let us hear from you this morning. Let it be your words that we hear and not our own, driving us to serve you more each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
As I thought back over the past few weeks and just recounted some of the conversations I've had with several of you, um, my mind has drifted from prayer to deep concern. And as I thought about all of this, I was, I was saying, God, what is it that we need to hear? When we think about all of this, all that's going on, all that's confronting people today, all the problems and difficulties of life, those of us who are children of God, we are followers of Jesus Christ, we have certainly come to the place in our lives where we understand that just because we are Christ followers does not mean that we will not face suffering in this life. We live in a broken world. A world that's stained by sin, a world that's under the curse of sin, and as a result, bad things happen in this world. And we, we stop and we say, okay, but I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. And yet, as we face life together, we watch and we experience and we know that life hurts. Life hurts. We are not an exception to the rule. I don't think that in our minds the, the thought that, okay, problems come, difficulties come, crisis happens. I don't think that that is so much what is troubling because we've grown to expect that. But I think when we get down to it, it's the concept of, okay, how do I survive this? The answer comes in sustaining grace. If you're taking notes, I hope you are. If you'll jot this definition down, because it plays a big part of where we're going today. The definition of grace. Grace is receiving what we do not deserve. When we're talking about grace of God, we are receiving from God that which we do not deserve, that which we cannot buy, that which we cannot earn. We are receiving it just as a gracious, kind, loving act of Almighty God. Now when we think about grace, we generally think of that in terms of forgiveness. The grace of God extends to us and offers that which we do not deserve in forgiveness. And so we embrace the cross of Jesus Christ, accept His payment for our sin, 
And through that sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we are granted forgiveness of our sin. How important and how vital it is because without the forgiveness of sin, we are under the condemnation of our own sin. We will face the wrath and judgment of Almighty God and will pay for our sin for all of eternity in a very real place called the lake of fire. So the forgiveness of God, the grace that God extends to us in forgiveness is vital for our lives. But please understand something. The grace of God does not end with forgiveness. The grace of God does not end at the point of salvation. Paul writes about the grace of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 6 through 10, he says, For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger from Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, and listen to this word. He doesn't say concerning this thing, I prayed. and He says concerning this thing, I pleaded, I pleaded with the Lord three times that, he, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says... Most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The good news about grace is that it does not end at salvation. But in fact... It's what sustains us through the trials and the difficulties and the adversities of life. This is what I want to talk to you about today. As I said, I hope you'll take notes. I hope you'll jot down four main thoughts that I want to talk about concerning sustaining grace. And there'll be a lot of things that you can put under your notes as well if you'll just take good notes. I think it will greatly benefit you because here's the incredible thing that you need to know about grace before we get into the sermon. Let me just tell you this. Grace is something you need to understand before you get into crisis. Grace is something that you need to embrace before you get to trials, before you get to difficulties. It's something you need to have a comprehension of so that when you get there, you have an understanding of what's going on. And it's much easier to deal with it as you go through it. So let's jump in. Number one. First thing I want you to know about sustaining grace is that sustaining grace is God's answers is God's answer to the painful circumstances of life sustaining grace is God's answer to the painful circumstances of life you see the reality is that God doesn't always change our circumstances that we can look at the Apostle Paul for proof positive of this. You can look at his life. You can back up a chapter into chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians and you can see that the Apostle Paul was facing persecution. Time and time again we find him being beaten. We find him being imprisoned. We find him being stoned. Him being shipwrecked. Him being bitten by a viper. We eventually see him giving his head. Him being beheaded for the cause of Christ. Time and time again the Apostle Paul went through crisis after crisis after crisis, after adversity, after adversity, after adversity. And what we find is that God did not change his situation. Please hear me in this. This is so very important. And we think about that and we say, but this was Paul. I mean, this is the great evangelist Paul. This is the one 
who made a statement that few of us would be willing to repeat. God, I will willingly give my life. I will willingly allow myself to be thrown into the pit of hell that my kinsmen can be saved, can come to know you. That's a huge statement. This is the one who served God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his might. I'm convinced that he was a dedicated follower of Jesus Christ. It shows in his life. And we could look at him and we say, God, this this is Paul that's going through this. Why would you allow this? And then we look at this passage that we just read and we see that not only did he face times of persecution and great suffering, but we also find that on top of that there was something physically wrong with him. He calls it a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan, one that's sent to disturb him, to hurt him, to, to mess him up, to stop his advancement for the kingdom of God. Here it is infecting him and we say, God, why? Why? And then we see that Paul pleaded with God, God, take this away. Take it away. And yet God did not change his circumstances. For us, it brings questions. It didn't seem to bring questions to the mind of Paul, though. In fact, Paul said, I understand, God, you've got a reason for this. He tells us in verse 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh has been given to me. Paul understood something. God works through sufferings. God brings about his purposes in our lives through suffering. For the Apostle Paul, God had something incredible he wanted him to do. God was going to use him to reach the Gentile nations. God was going to use him to take the gospel to the ends of the world. And God could not do that through a prideful person. Paul had experienced incredible revelations from God himself. He met Jesus face to face after Jesus had ascended back to heaven. It was Jesus that taught him for three years. He had been in the presence of Jesus Christ. And with that and his healing abilities and the other things that God was doing through him, Paul could have easily, because he was nothing more than man, become prideful over what was going on and said, but wait a minute, look at what God's doing through me. But the Bible tells us that God resists a proud man. He pushes him low. But what does he do with the humble? He exalts him. He elevates him. He prepares him for something greater. He prepares him for what's coming next. He prepares him to be in place for service to God in a way that he could have never been in place for had he not gone through this time of adversity in his life. Paul simply responds to that and says, Therefore, I would much rather boast in my infirmities that the power of God may rest upon me. Please know this. God is ready to exalt some of us in this congregation. He's ready to move us into a greater place of service for Him. And I know that because some of us today are facing great suffering. Some of us today are facing times of unbelievable suffering overwhelming circumstances. I know that firsthand because I've heard it straight from you. And I'm overwhelmed by some of the things I've heard in the past few weeks. Things I have never heard before in my life. And I just stop and think. 
God, we don't understand these things. And we don't like them. But I cannot wait to see what you do through them. It is this sustaining grace that we don't deserve, we can't earn, we can't possibly afford, that God extends to us and says, yes, it's hard, but just know that I'm up to something. You see, sustaining grace is God's answer to the painful circumstances of life. Number two. The second thing I want you to know about sustaining grace is that sustaining grace is what enables us to continue when the circumstances of life don't change. Sustaining grace is what enables us to continue going, to keep going. When everyone else around us is saying, how in the world are they even getting out of bed? How in the world could they possibly keep going in the face of this adversity? Sustaining grace is that which enables us to keep going. When we have prayed, and we've prayed, and we've prayed, and yet for some reason God sees fit to still take our loved one. When we've prayed, and we've prayed, and we've prayed, and yet the sickness doesn't go away. When we've prayed, and we've prayed, and we've sought God, and we've cried out to Him, and the, the relationships are not solved. The problems don't go away. The tendency in our hearts is to stop and say, but God... Do you not care? Do you not understand what I'm going through? In itself, this is a great gift of God's grace. That God is big enough to listen to us. He's big enough to allow us cry out to Him in pain, to cry out to Him in anger, to cry out to Him through our sufferings, to, to tell God we don't like it, to tell God that we're mad at Him, to tell God we don't understand all these things. God is big enough to hear our cries and to respond to us with compassion. Someone recently was teaching uh, regarding John the Baptist. I think it was Van, but I'm not positive. And one of the things we learned through that study was that John the Baptist was a remarkable man of God, much like the Apostle Paul. Jesus said that up until this point, there's not been a man born of woman that is comparable to, the, to, to John the Baptist. Remarkable, remarkable guy. He served God with all of his heart. He served God with his strength. He served God creatively. It was an amazing thing to look at the ministry of John the Baptist. How he prepared the way for Jesus Christ. But the time came that John the Baptist was taken and he was put into prison. You remember the story. He eventually would be beheaded for his stand for Jesus Christ. And in the process of this time, John the Baptist, this incredible man of God, became discouraged and he became hurt over what was going on. And he sent his disciples to Jesus Christ. He said, go and see him and ask him, tell me the truth, Jesus. Are you really the Messiah? Or do we need to be looking for somebody else? Desperation. Desperation. I've served you. And yet for some reason I'm in prison now. And you've not changed what's going on. Are you really who you say you are. It's hard to imagine that we could talk to God like that. And yet the pain brings on things and feelings and emotions that 
one of the few ways we have to deal with them is just to speak it. It's also hard for me to believe that God made the universe, who made us, who controls our lives, would allow us to talk to Him that way. And yet the incredible thing about God is that instead of responding with condemnation, instead of responding with hatred and bitterness and anger in His heart, God reaches out to those who are hurting with compassion. We see that through the story of John the Baptist. When his disciples came to Jesus, Jesus could have easily said, Just, who do you think you are? Do you know who I am? And yet Jesus instead said, Go and tell John what you've seen. Go and tell him that the blind are receiving their sight, that the lame are walking, that the lepers are healed, and that the kingdom of God is being proclaimed. Go and tell him. Tell him not to be offended because of me. Grace of God. He's big enough to hear us. He's big enough to accept the criticism and the anger and the pain. And He's kind enough to extend to us that which we do not deserve. And that is His compassion in the middle of our crisis. Number three. Now I also came to realize that there are some very tough truths about sustaining grace that we have to know. I, as you look on the screen, you'll see number three come up. I just put these are truths about sustaining grace. But, but when you get to, to hearing what these truths are, what you come to understand is that these are tough, tough truths. These are very tough truths. So what are these truths that we need to understand? I want to give you three of them. Number one is simply this. When we understand that God is working in our lives, and when we understand that God is doing what we cannot do for ourselves, we also have to understand that giving up is unjustifiable. Let me tell you something. For a true follower of Jesus Christ, quitting is not an option. It's not a real option. We want to, don't we? Man, the pain gets overwhelming. We want to stop. We want to give up. And in fact, there are many people around us who are saying, why are you still going? How are you still going? How are you dealing with this? The enemy would love nothing more than to cause us to distrust God. He would love nothing more than to get our attention and our focus on our circumstances and off of Jesus Christ. He would love it if we would become narrow in our sight and only see what's going on in our own lives. But God is at work. And God is always on our side. And when God is on our side, if God be for us, who can possibly be against us? Yes, problems and difficulties come. Adversity hits. Crisis invades our lives. But God is on our side, working for our good and for His glory. God is on our side. When God is on our side, quitting is not an option. Hard truth number two. Even though we think we deserve one, God does not promise explanations. God allows us to know His nature. 
He allows us to understand about His plan so that we can comprehend what's going on. We'll see more about that in just a few minutes. He allows us to, to know a little bit about what's happening so that we can understand that God is working and doing something in our lives. That He's producing power that we would not have had we not submitted to Him even in crisis. But sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes we just want an answer. God, why? Why did you allow my loved one to die? Why am I facing this time of health crisis? Why am I going through this severe financial downfall? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? And there are times, I believe, when God gives us an explanation. When we maybe get through it, we can look back and we can say, Oh yeah. Man, that saved me so much problem, so much pain. It hurt through the, through the process, but I can see it was better for me. But God doesn't promise us explanations. I don't think it hurts for us to ask. I don't think it hurts for us to, in that time of desperation just to call out and say, God, why is this going on? But we have to respect the position of God. We have to respect the fact that He is God and we are not. We are nothing like it. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are high above our thoughts. He sees an eternal perspective that we can't even begin to glimpse a snapshot of. We're looking at a little bitty snapshot. And God is looking at the entire perspective of eternity. And he's orchestrating and he's moving and he's planning. And he says, this is what's going on. You don't understand it. And you don't really need to know all about it. But you do need to know I'm trustworthy. And then finally, number three. We've alluded to it through the process, but... Hard truth number three is that God will work all things out for our good. The good of those who love Him. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. All things. The good, the bad, the ugly. All of these things somehow are being orchestrated by God. God is allowing the suffering at times. He's planning the suffering at times to bring about His purpose to prepare us for something that follows or to save us from something that would come. God is at work orchestrating that which is good for those who love Him. I told you at the beginning that Grace is something you need to understand before you get into crisis. Because when you get to these thoughts, you're in the middle of crisis, you don't really want to hear them. I, I think we have to be so careful when we're talking with someone that's going through something hard. And I'm probably the worst one in the room at this. We want to quote scripture all the time to them and somehow that in our brain is going to solve the problem. And they're hurting. Now I'm not saying there's anything wrong with quoting scripture. But I think at some point we're better off just standing by and listening. We're just better off with our presence than with our wisdom. You can take that for what it's worth. But I think when someone is, is sorrowing, they've worked through the process of why this is happening, and they've gone through all of those thoughts and all those emotions. What they really need from us is for us just to be there, for us just to listen, not to try to solve their problems. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will direct us and give us wisdom to speak to those things. But I think more times than not, silence is golden. But if we know that going into crisis, if we know that God is working for our good going in, then it makes dealing with the crisis a little easier to survive. Not easy.
not easy but somehow it's a little easier to survive let's jump into number four how does this work how does grace work I want to give to you seven steps of grace these are not going to be listed in order they're not going to be the way you will incur them when you hit crisis but these are things that if you can grasp them and you can learn them and you can hold on to them when you get into crisis or if you're already in crisis that they will give you encouragement and they will help you survive the crisis that you are in number one grace releases supernatural strength grace releases supernatural strength it's strength that helps us keep going in the middle of pain in the middle of suffering and in the middle of loss grace extends to us that which we do not deserve that which we cannot earn that which we cannot possibly afford it gives to us the ability to keep going the Apostle Paul said it didn't he he said he said for when I'm weak then I'm strong not because he could reach down in the depths of his soul and find the strength to keep going no because he's not supernatural he was natural and if we're gonna keep going in the middle of crisis we must know that strength comes from something outside of ourselves because in the middle of crisis is when we are at our weakest and that something is found only in the Holy Spirit of God it comes to live within us at the time of salvation the Holy Spirit of God lives within us and as we humble ourselves in the middle of crisis and we submit ourselves to God the Holy Spirit gives us strength to keep going he's the one that gives us the strength to survive the crisis number two grace ignites determination to keep going when everyone else is saying why haven't you given up you're still going why because you understand the grace of Almighty God does that mean that this is somehow easy for you no no it doesn't mean that you don't cry yourself to sleep every night it doesn't mean that you don't hurt every minute of the day but what it means is because God is extending to you something that you don't deserve that you can't earn yourself God is providing you with something that will ignite your determination to survive the crisis anything that gives you that determination during the middle of crisis is vital and it is the Holy Spirit of God working in us that provides that ignition. Number three. Grace reminds us that God is always with us. God has given to us an incredible promise when he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you forsake you he doesn't say I will never leave you unless you get in a really bad crisis and then all of a sudden man I'm sorry I'm gonna be like everybody else you're gonna look around nobody's there to help mm -mm. God is always with us there are times in crisis when God seems to be silent when it appears that God is not listening to our prayers that he is not hearing our cries and we're thinking God where are you that's when we have to rely upon the promise that we don't deserve that God's presence is always there always there number four grace points us towards the father's goal in allowing trials grace points us it directs us toward the father's goals in allowing trials if God is allowing adversity and problems and crisis into our lives for a reason the grace of God is going to point us in the direction of pursuing where God wants us to end up the grace of God is going to give us the courage and the determination to keep going and to keep learning and to grow and to mature so that when we come out on the other side we are prepared for what God wants us to know 
You know, I haven't gone through anything big lately. But I can tell you that even in the little things that I face, one of my prayers to God is, God, help me to learn what you want me to know this time. I don't want to repeat this. It is the grace of God that points us in the direction of learning. It points us in the direction of knowing what God wants us to know through this trial, through this difficulty, through this crisis. Number five. Grace reminds us that God uses trials to strengthen our faith and to deepen our intimacy with Him. Grace reminds us that God uses trials. He uses them for the purpose of strengthening our faith and deepening our intimacy with Him. This is an amazing thought. God wants to grow our faith. And there's something about crisis that allows God to do just that. There's something about crisis that brings us into a deeper intimacy with God as we learn we are totally hopeless and helpless without Him. As we learn to depend deeper upon Him, the intimacy and the bond between us and God grows and our faith strengthens in ways that it could not possibly strengthen if there was not a crisis. You know, when, when parents are seeing their children go down roads that are very dangerous and very scary, you know who gets closer to God? The child or the parents? It's always the parents, isn't it? God uses crisis to bring us closer to Him. Number six. Grace assures us that the Lord sets limitations on what can happen to His children. Grace assures us that the Lord sets those limitations. That He is in control. Now please understand, God setting limitations may, does not mean that death won't occur. But it does mean that God knows what's happening. He's not in heaven saying, oh, oh no, I didn't know that would occur. Hmm. God knows what's going on in our lives. And since He knows what's best for our lives, He asked us to trust Him through the process. Number seven. Grace gives us faith to believe God will transform tough times into something good. Grace gives us the faith to believe that God will somehow transform these tough times into something that is good. God, I cannot see how in the world my circumstances could ever turn out good. That's where a lot of us are. Because we see what's going on. We see the difficulties. We see the pain. We see the suffering, the sorrow that is causing us and our families and so on and so on. And yet, once you've gone through a few crises with God, once you've faced some of these things with God, you get to a deeper place with God where you say, Okay, God, I still don't like it. It hurts. I'm crying myself to sleep every night. But there's a little part of me that is anxious to see how this turns out good. If you are in crisis, if you are weary, you're worn out, you feel like you've been drugged through the mud, take heart in this. God cares about you much more than you know, much more than you will ever realize this side of eternity. What is God up to in your life? Will you trust Him in the process?
Would you stand with me, please? You know, when I look at our church, and I say that I think God is taking us somewhere great. I think God's got something in mind for our church that's incredible. Part of it is seeing the development of believers, but part of it also is seeing the suffering that's going on in our church. Because suffering brings closeness. Suffering brings strengthening in faith if we allow God to do that. If we submit ourselves to Him. And when I look at the suffering that's going on in our church family, I'm not excited by the suffering, but I am deeply excited by the possibilities. God's working in your heart right now. Maybe you're going through something really hard. And you'd like to have some people pray over you, pray with you. You'd like to just spend time with God by yourself. And I invite you to come this morning. Just come and find your place here at the front, either side of the auditorium. If you want someone to pray with you, if you'll just nod at me as you walk down, I'll get someone with you. We will start a prayer vigil with you. That not only covers this morning, but will continue. Jason's going to begin singing in just a moment. When he does, you, you just start making your way. Just come on. Come on now. Jason, sing. Christ alone, I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. Pray for others around the auditorium that didn't feel liberty to come because of maybe the circumstances and their situation. Let's, let's just spend a little time praying for one another right now. Would you join me please? is such a comfort to know that you care for us that you control our lives and even when bad things happen somehow you're working to bring about good
Father, for these who are in the middle of crisis, facing adversity in their lives right now, I pray, God, that you will, you will encourage them in you. And even as David did, that they will take heart in your word and in your promises and be encouraged in you at this point. Pray, Father, for the one who may feel like they cannot go on. Father, would you invade their lives now? Supernatural power. Would you draw them to yourself? Would you bring them into a right relationship with you? And Father, would you work in their lives to help them to survive this time of crisis. You are such a great God. Thank you that as the song said that was sung by Amy and Jason before I got up, this isn't home. This is just a temporary place that we're hanging out for a while. Be glorified in our lives. Be glorified in our church. Father, we submit to you today. Work through us by the Holy Spirit. Bring many people to Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, would you grab your connection card one more time, please? Wherever you placed it earlier, would you just take it out one more time? Please make sure you fill this card out and drop it in the offering plate. On the back of the card, there's some things that are really unique to this. If you'd like to have more information about certain things, you can request that through this connection card. Uh, but specifically, if you feel God leading you into a relationship with Him, and you'd like to know more about what that means, the top left-hand side on the back card, there's a box that's entitled, My Next Step Today Is. The first place underneath that says, Request information about becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to know more, if you'll check that box, I'm not going to embarrass you, I'm not going to point you out, I'm not going to call your name. But I will stick a couple of small, easy-to-read books in the mail to you tomorrow that will help you understand God's plan of salvation. And then the only other thing I'll do is I'll give you a call in about two or three weeks just to see if you have any questions. If you'd like to know more, if you'll check that box, we'll get that to you. And then you can also uh, submit a prayer request just for church leadership or for church-wide. If you'd like to do so, uh, please indicate that on the card. The other thing I want you to, to see is in the book racks in front of you, most of them, some of them have been taken, but in most of the book racks, you'll find one of our discipleship cards. If you'd like to be part of one of the discipleship classes, if you'll check the one that best fits your time frame, we did our best to accommodate everybody. And in the time spots that we have available with those that were turned in, we accommodated somewhere around 88 or 89 percent of you. And I'm sorry that we weren't able to get everybody's time spot that you requested, but hopefully this will be a good, a good fit for you. If you'd like to be part of that, those classes start this evening. So if you'll get one of these cards, you can check on there, or you can just write on the top of your connection card. Classes are available on Sunday this evening starting at 5 p.m. at 6.30 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. They're available Monday and Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Wednesday morning now at 9.30. card says 9 and 10, but we've combined those two at 9.30. And then Wednesday evening at 5.45 and 8 o'clock. So if you'd like to be part of that, please indicate that on your connection card or in that form and we'll get you the information as quickly as we can this afternoon so you know where to be if your class starts today. Well, let's receive our offering. And um, I got a prayer request before. Tell me his name again. Swan. Swan. Um, is your uncle 
uncle is, is in the process of called the family in and uh, let's be praying for him now through this time for the family and uh, let's, let's just remember to pray for each other man there's a lot going on let's just keep each other before the throne of grace continually call out each other's names before God and at the same time let's receive our offering and pray for that as well Father I pray now for Swan as he's uh, facing what could possibly be these final hours I know that for the family this is a very scary time and a very troubling time but I pray God that you'll give grace in this time as well uh, that they will see you working and Father if, if it is the situation that maybe one is away from you or does not know you I pray that you will draw them to yourself through this process but Father just give comfort I pray for those who are here today who are suffering once again, Father. I pray that, that you will strengthen them, that you will draw them close to you. Father, that as a church body that we'll continue to love one another so much that we reach out with words of encouragement and we reach out with kindness and we reach out through our prayer. Father, may we not let each other down by ceasing to pray for each other. I pray now that your blessings will be on our offering. Thank you for your goodness to us in meeting our needs. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There are going to be a few changes taking place in our Fit Together program in the coming weeks that you want to be made aware of. First of all, our Saturday morning circuit training class that takes place every other Saturday morning in the gym is going to go through the month of May and then it's going to stop through the summer and it's going to resume back in the fall. Then our P90X class that takes place every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. in the youth room is going to just be on Tuesdays from now on. If you're looking to get in shape, Fit Together is a great way for you to do that. There are several ways that you can stay in touch with Miles Straight online through Facebook pages, Twitter pages, and things like that. But the best place to go is to our newly designed website where you can do several things, including linking to our Facebook and Twitter page, signing up for our new e-bulletin that we put out every week, learning more about the discipleship groups that are going on in our church right now, and even watch live worship when you aren't able to make it to the services. If you want to find out more information about any of this, just visit the website at milestraightbc.org. Next Sunday morning, we're going to have a very special service as we have a baby dedication. If you would like for your child to be involved in the baby dedication, you can see Amber Wasden in the nursery check-in station right after the service. Make sure you make your plans to be back next Sunday morning at 1045. You don't want to miss it. Outreach Banquet is coming fairly soon as well. It's in September. Plans are already being made and a lot of things are taking place. If you'd like to be part in helping our Outreach Banquet for the homeless and the needy in our area, we'd love to have you be part of that. Uh, you can simply see Amy or Susan. Would y'all slip your hands up please? Go by and see one of these ladies over here. You can let them know what area you're interested in or they'll tell you the different areas and direct you to the leader of that team. There will also be a meeting right after we finish here in about 35 seconds uh, for those who would be interested in going on a mission trip to Clarkston, Georgia. As you may know, this is a great mission field. A lot of people have come in fleeing from their countries and they've gathered in Clarkston, Georgia and we'll be sending a group down in summer to help uh, evangelize and make friends in those areas. If you'd like to be part of that, you can see Clip right after the service. He'll be up front to meet with you. All right, thank you so much for being here. Hey, Hung, great to have you here. Would you slip your hand up? Hung Thack, one of our missionaries, would you let him know you're praying for him? He's done an incredible job serving God in our area. Getting ready to move to California, is that right? Man, we hate to see you move off. And still be serving God, same, same way, but just with a different section of uh, the country. So please be praying for them as they go. Thank you for being here. You're dismissed. <laughs>